this is not just my church home. This is really, I mean, this is my home. And many of you know what that means. This is my home. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about the road of life. And um, I guess my question is, do you have a favorite road? I do have a favorite road. But first of all, let me, you know, sometimes if you've been to, um, like, Hawaii, the Hana Road um, is sometimes some people's, they talk about how pretty it is. Going to the Sun Highway in Glacier, we've taken the train out to Glacier and you can drive along the Going to the Sun Highway and that's beautiful. Um, let's see, Route 66, you see the movies about that and you're, you hear people talking about everything that happened on the Mother Road, Route 66. Then you got Music Highway in Eastern Kentucky. My dad worked for AAA and I did a lot of maps growing up, so <laughs> I think about maps when I think of these places. But my favorite road is our beloved US 42. And I, it really, it's, it's beautiful, as you all know. It's sometimes dangerous, curvy, sometimes falling into the river, but it really is beautiful and it also goes through Louisville where I live now. So it truly is my favorite road. So roads are good, but as we all know, you sometimes come to forks in the road. And there's a parallel to all this with um, several different things. One is The Wizard of Oz, the movie. You remember The Wizard of Oz? And Dorothy, you know, ends up in the land of Oz and here she is, and she has to get to the wizard, because the wizard is going to fix everything. The wizard, wizard is going to be able to get her home. So, <clears throat> excuse me, she said, t they tell her, go down the yellow brick road. So, okay, she goes down the yellow brick road, then there's the fork. You remember where I'm talking about in the movie, if you've watched that recently, and there's a scarecrow, and she says, well, which way is right? And he, you know, points both directions. So sometimes those kinds of things happen to us. We're at those forks in the road. We don't know which way to go. That brings us to our scripture for today, Psalm 139. So I, let's, if you want to turn to that or just listen, we'll read most of Psalm 139. The inescapable God. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for the darkness is as light as you. And then we skip down to verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. David is describing how God does always and will always know where we are. We cannot hide. As we come to these various intersections like David, let us invite God through our prayers to search our hearts and fill us with wisdom. So here are some biblical examples of some others who have faced forks in the road. In 1 Samuel, around 1100 B.C., a woman named Hannah could not have children. 
So she poured out her soul to the Lord. Have you ever prayed and not received an answer? To continue to hope in the Lord himself. Not a dream, a person, or a desired event. Several years ago, I came upon a story, and I have done a little, I can't find exactly where I found it now, but it, and maybe some of you all may know. If you know, let me know. It's about prisoners of war. And a survivor said that the ones who survived did not say, I'll be home by Christmas. I'll be home by my birthday. Those who did survive say, I'll be home someday, Lord willing. May we remember it's not, I'll be released by, I'll be sober by, I'll be employed by, I'll be married by, X date. May we instead say, these things will happen, Lord willing. Well, in due time, Hannah did have a child, and she named him Samuel, for I have asked him of the Lord. My son is named Samuel. In 1 Samuel um, 3, the Lord called Samuel. He listened and responded. He became a judge. So as time grow goes on, Samuel grows very old. And the people demanded that Samuel appoint for them a king to rule over them like all the other nations. We've got to be like everybody else. So the, but the, the Lord had cautioned them against this. But ultimately, the Lord did grant their request. So the Lord tells Samuel to anoint Saul to be the king. Well, Saul had a fairly good start, but his later years, as you know, were not quite as successful. Saul did not completely follow God's direction. He, Saul grew impatient and acted on his own accord instead of following God. Later on, in 1 Samuel 31, Saul died. His, and this is kind of interesting, I think. His life was summarized in 1 Chronicles. Saul died because he did not inquire of the Lord. I believe inquiring, talking to the Lord, praying, leads to relationship. One of the major points, I think, of these lessons that I've thought about is our greatest need is a relationship with God, not just asking information or certain kinds of things, but the relationship with God. God desires a relationship, not just, we, not just that we ask advice on a certain subject. To that end, I have several friends who have sought God's direction on different kinds of subjects, health, marriages, children, employment. One friend told me about asking God for healing in her marriage. Then her husband left her. Another friend changed employment in the spring, thought this person was going to a better work, working relationship, and then right before Christmas, the person loses their job. And no, the employer wasn't Scrooge, but my friend thought that they were. But these things happen, and you might say, well, why did God allow me to walk down that road? How could that have happened? I believe that the idea of relationship involves looking at the whole landscape, not getting hung up, if you will, on either the high nor the low of where we're going in this road, but look at this whole landscape. And when you do, you will, through God's help, be able to see better which, which turn to take. And when... Even when you're following God's direction, some of these turns don't turn out so well. You still know, just like Shirley was explaining to the young people, that God is walking with you. Jesus is walking with you. That's part of our whole resurrection story here on this Sunday after Easter. Um, which kind of brings us to the idea of free will. God gives us free will which is a wonderful gift, as we all know. Um, but the, the interesting thing about that, and the thing which I think is, is one of those mysteries, we have free will, we can decide which road to go down, but God knows what we're going to choose before we do it. 
you say, well, that doesn't make sense, and maybe, maybe it may not, but that's the way. We have the free will. God knows what we're going to do, and God is walking there with us down whatever path that it is. God remains in relationship with us, and if we maintain that relationship, I believe that when we inquire, we'll feel God's presence in relationship. You all may feel it right now. I do every time that I'm in here. I feel God's presence in this place. That's the basis of relationship. That's how we're, we're able to cope with life's challenges. It's not just, people talk about arrow prayers, and that, those are great, but it's not just an informational kind of a request. It's a relationship that we're going for. Um, to that end, sometimes they're wrong turns. There's several situations in the Bible where persons took those wrong turns initially. Rahab was a prostitute, yet she helped the men of God in their quest to enter the promised land. That's in Joshua 2. She is memorialized later in Hebrews and James too, as being considered righteous, made right with God, and was part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. In 2 Samuel 11, King David took a wrong turn with Bathsheba. The married woman, he observed bathing, she becomes pregnant, David puts her husband on the front line of the battle, pretty much assuring that he would be killed, and he was killed. David was then confronted by the prophet Nathan, and um, where Nathan points this out to him, and David realizes, oh, I did make that wrong decision. But then he does the next right thing, and he confesses. David is characterized in Acts as a man after God's own heart. So even when we find ourselves on some of these wrong pass, confess. Go after God's own heart. And uh, again, it's um, unlike Saul, who was characterized as not inquiring of the Lord. Later on, in uh, 1 Kings 2, David is giving a charge or order to his son Solomon, who's going to take over the king. Um, David knew by that time he was getting old, and he said, like everyone else, it's going to be my time to, to die eventually. So he admonished Solomon to be strong, courageous, and to be his best. He told Solomon to follow the commandments of God. And that reminded me, when I was young, my dad would stand me on his desk in his office, and he would say, be a good girl, have a good day, be your best. My mother would say the same thing as, as, as she went off to teach here at Gallatin County High School. Um, so I thought about that, that charge, if you will. Be your best, have a good day. Um, and it seems like that charge no, never goes out of style. It, it happened to be the, uh, the be your best was a motto at my son's elementary school. So it was plastered everywhere. And so I would think about that charge, if you will, be your best. So as part of being his best, doing his best, Solomon did receive the kingdom at a young age, and he admitted to his credit he was inexperienced. In a dream, God told Solomon to ask what God should give him. So as you may remember, Solomon asked for an understanding mind and the ability to discern between good and evil. So God was pleased that Solomon had asked, not for long life and riches, but for this wisdom. And God gave that to him. So as part of our relationship with God, we make this free will choice to follow God's charge. We choose to act with wisdom. That term, the wisdom of Solomon, we still hear it some today. And choosing wisely does require wisdom. There's so many choices. There were a lot of choices when I was growing up. I guess there are many, many, many more choices today. 
Uh, so, and as we approach these inevitable decisions, I just pray that we'll continue to seek God's wisdom and ask God for understanding and wisdom and discernment. We'll build that relationship with the Lord and we'll listen to God. We'll feel God's presence. And when we are approaching those turns in the road, just stop for a moment and I think that we'll hear. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we humbly, humbly come before you. Please open our eyes to choose the best road. Thank you for walking beside us on these roads. We pray for wisdom in choosing the correct path when we're faced with these inevitable decisions. May we learn from your word. In Jesus' name, amen.